Let me invite your attention this morning once again to the little letter of Jude. We are looking at this little letter under the banner of fighting for the faith. Jude. We're going to be looking at verses 3 and 4. Let's begin in verse 1, though, for the flow of thought. We have the introduction. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are the called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. The day after Christmas, December 26th, 1858, 24-year-old Charles Haddon Spurgeon stepped into the pulpit at New Park Street Church to deliver his sermon for that particular Lord's Day. The sermon was based on one verse from the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 52, verse 12. The Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your reward. Listen as Spurgeon begins this sermon a sermon in which he compared and contrasted and highlighted a biblical reality about the Christian life and about the church. That biblical reality is that the church has been called as an army of God and that the Christian life is actually a life of fighting for the truth. Spurgeon began that day this way. He said, The church of Christ is continually represented in Scripture, under the figure of an army. Yet its captain is the prince of peace. Its object is the establishment of peace. And its soldiers are men of a peaceful disposition. The spirit of war is at the extremely opposite point of the spirit of the gospel. Yet, nevertheless, the church on earth has, and until the second advent must be, the church militant, the church armed, the church warring, the church conquering. And how is that? It is in the very order of things that it must be so. Now listen to him. Truth could not be truth in this world if it were not a warring thing. And we should at once suspect that if it were not true, if error were friends with it, The spotless purity of truth must always be at war with the blackness of heresy and lies. I say again, it would cast a suspicion upon its own nature. We should feel at once that it was not true if it were not at enmity with the false. And so, at this present time, the church of Christ, being herself the only incarnation of truth left upon this world, must be at war with error of every kind of shape. Or if she were not, we should at once conclude that she was not herself the church of the living God. Now, I'll be honest with you, that's a heavy, weighty statement. It's one that grabs you by the throat and gives you the death stare because it's making a statement about the nature of the people of God, both the church and individually as believers. And that is this. That the truth of the gospel is so true and so important that we should expect error and heresy constantly. The very nature of the gospel, the very truth of the gospel, we should expect to be under attack constantly. And therefore, we must be prepared to be engaged in the battle. If you are not engaged in the battle for truth, then you are not rightly, according to Spurgeon, the church. You will find yourself being questioned if you're not actually fighting for that which is true. In other words, the church until Jesus comes again is always at war for the truth. Always engaged in a battle with error. 
Therefore, the Christian life is of necessity and nature an ongoing battle for the truth. Why? Because there is a mortal enemy perpetually seeking the demise of the Christian and the compromise of the church. Since the very beginning, when Jesus walked in human flesh, God incarnate, in the desert, he came under attack with overtures of compromise, 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 compromise the truth, compromise the truth. But it didn't begin there. My friends, listen, the truth of God has been under attack since day one. Since in the garden, Satan said to Eve, did God really say that? That in itself was raising a question about truth. Now, we live in a day in which, uh, if you're paying attention, you're being told there really is no such thing as absolute truth. That you have your truth, and she has her truth, and we have our truth, and they have their truth, but it's all true. It's all truth. Even if it's contradictory, it's still truth. By the way, when you say there's no such thing as absolute truth, you've just violated what you've said because there are no absolutes. Is itself an absolute? People are so dumb. Now, we are looking under or looking at this letter under what you might consider to be a provocative title, fighting for the faith. Not fighting for faith, or faith in relative terms or general terms, but fighting for the faith, the absolute faith, which in essence is a fight for the truth. We have been called to engage and stand for truth. Jude is dealing in absolute truth. My friends, the gospel is not relative. The gospel is absolute. And he exhorts these believers to contend for that faith, to fight for that faith, to engage in what we could very well call the truth war. We looked last week at the opening intro. We were reminded that this author, Jude, is the brother of Jesus Christ, the half-brother, biological brother of Jesus Christ. I told you last week that it is an absolute fascinating thing to me that his name is Jude. That's an abbreviated form of Judah. That is the Hebrew name. The Greek name is Judas. Yes, Jesus has a brother named Judas. And yes, the ultimate apostate is a man by the name of Judas. What an overture of grace it is for God to take someone named Judas, uh, the name of an absolute betrayer, and use that to show that grace is the bottom line for everything. And in this opening, we saw that Jude has a great affection for his audience. We, we don't know exactly who the audience is. Jude doesn't give us enough information for us to be able to pinpoint a specific congregation. I believe that's by design, by sovereign design which is why we call Jude one of the general epistles, or you may actually hear Jude, uh, James as well, called a Catholic epistle. Don't for one moment confuse that word Catholic epistle with Catholic church. You've heard me say this before. When it comes to the word Catholic, the word Catholic means universal. There's big C Catholic and little C Catholic. Big C Catholic is the Roman Catholic church, which I believe... I hope this doesn't offend you, but if it does, it speaks more to you than it does to me. Uh, Roman Catholicism, as a general rule, is an apostate form of Christianity. I'll, I'll explain it more later if you'd like to. If I just offended you, come talk to me. Don't get mad and leave and go home. Just, you know, come and let me help you understand why. By the way, it's not the only form. And I'm not saying that there are no genuine believers in the Catholic Church, but if someone truly believes salvation as presented by the Catholic Church, they're embracing an apostate form of Christianity because Mary is not your Savior. And little c Catholic, I didn't mean to get into that, but you know me, it happens. 
little c Catholic, which is the application of that term universal. Catholic epistle just means it is a message aimed at the church universal at all times and in all seasons. And that is certainly the case with Jude here. In this case, Jude is writing to believers not only in his day but in our day. And he, is, and he, and he, just, he loves the church. He understands what the church is. And he understands the danger that they are facing. So Jude expresses that affection, says, here's what I wanted to do, but because of a danger that I'm seeing, I am compelled to change the message and address a different topic, which he does. So if I had actually continued last week and talked to you about the author, the audience, the attitude, and the affection of Jude, I would have added one more, and that would be the appeal of Jude. What is it that Jude is actually appealing to these believers to do? And we find it here in verse 3. He says, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. Jude's purpose in writing is to appeal to the church to join in fighting for the faith against an enemy that has crept in unaware. And his appeal is for them not just to acknowledge that there's a problem, but to actually engage in the problem. This is not an appeal just to pastors and elders. It's not just appeal an appeal to deacons and leaders. It is an appeal to the church overall. It is an appeal to every believer to contend for the faith, to join in the fight, to become a soldier in the truth war. So let's look at this appeal, and I want to look at it under three broad headings this morning. The first thing I want you to see as we get into the more specifics of this is what I want to call the urgency of Jude's appeal. We see it in the opening words of this third verse. I felt the necessity to write to you appealing. I I felt the necessity. I was going to write about our common salvation. I was going to talk about how wonderful the security is that we have in Christ Jesus. But looking at the cultural winds and what's happened in the church, I felt it was absolutely essential. It was necessary. In fact, there's an urgency about this appeal that you actually engage in contending for the faith. So there is an urgency in Jude's tone. And there is an urgency in the choice of his words. It's as if Jude is sounding an alarm. Very much similar to the alarms that are sounded In hospitals, when someone goes into respiratory arrest or cardiac arrest, uh, perhaps you've been in a hospital and you've heard these things before. Uh, All of a sudden, it comes blaring out sometimes with a ding or a ding or a ding to get your attention. Uh, Code blue, and then it gives you a location. Uh, Back a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, when I worked at the VA hospital, the code wasn't a code blue, it it was a... a code for Harvey team. And when you heard Harvey team, this location, you knew exactly what it was. And that that code that was going out was a call of urgency for a specific group of people who were to respond. They had special training, special skills in life-saving intervention, and they were being summoned to a specific location to administer life-saving aid. Well, that's what Jude is doing here. Jude is summoning a Harvey team, a spiritual Harvey team to come and to administer life-saving intervention because there is a peril at work in the spiritual lives of these particular believers. My friends, listen to me. As a Christian, you should be able to recognize life-threatening theological error and address it. From the very beginning of the church, the initial church all the way down to today. One of the things that I really have always enjoyed is the history of heresy. Is looking at how from within the church, and it, it never fails, it's always from within the church. The danger that the church has faced has never really come from outside. The biggest outside threat the church faces is martyrdom. And here's the reality in church history. When the church was faced with martyrdom or death, the church grew astronomically. Consistently. But when it faced difficulty from within, threats from within, it tended to decay. Because infiltrators would come and begin to teach things that were in error. 
error about who Jesus is, error about what salvation is, error about who we are and what we are. That, that's the big thing today. I've already alluded to some of this. And the church is becoming complicit in it. In that we are actually joining the error when we want to reinforce people in their delusion that they can determine what sex they are, when they can determine what sexual practice is acceptable. We are undermining the very biblical anthropology of the image of God in man. And as a result, we're undermining theological truth and we're opening people up to damnation. Yes, it's that important and it's, it matters that much. My friends, anything that threatens a right perception of the gospel threatens the eternal life of people. So yes, it's important. Yes, it matters. So Jude, recognizing the truth war, gives this appeal. And the appeal, the word that he uses, the word that he uses that is a rendered appeal here is a word frequently found in the New Testament. It's one we see regularly. It's a derivative of the word that gives us the word that Jesus used for the Holy Spirit as the helper. Uh, parakaleo, to call along beside. It's found and translated variously as appeal, sometimes as urge, sometimes as beseech. For instance, in the King James translation, of Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore, I beseech you, brothers, by the mercies of God. More modern translations render that. I urge you, I beg you, I appeal to you, I plead with you. It's a very strong word. Because of God's mercy, I beg you to give yourself as a living sacrifice. That word implies an urgency. It recognizes an imminent threat and an urgent response that's necessary. Jude recognizes the immediate danger to these believers. And he responds. In fact, so urgent is the situation that he changes directions in this letter. He completely changes the theme he wants to emphasize. So, the appeal is an urgent appeal. The urgency of Jude's appeal. Secondly, not only is there an urgency, there's actually an emergency to Jude's appeal. His appeal is that you contend earnestly for the faith. You, you, you give it all you've got. Again, I've, I've alluded to this verb or, or mentioned this word specifically these last two messages, and I'm going to do it again here. This word that he uses for contend earnestly is a word that comes from the arena, from athletic competition, from military skirmishes. It's the word that gives us our English word agony. The very Greek word has the implication of an intense exertion. Something that's going to really stretch you. Something that's going to demand effort. Something that, are you ready for this, might even hurt a little bit. You've heard the expression in training, no pain, no gain. Right? You're supposed to work out until it hurts. I never have liked that. <laughs> However, there are times when you just have to do that. You know, for instance, when you have a joint replaced, uh, the most important thing, y'all listen, because some of you may need some joints replaced. Take some advice from someone who had one when he was only 47 years old. I knew then, I'd seen enough to know, the most important part of a joint replacement is the therapy afterwards. And what you have to do is you have to really work hard even if it hurts. You just do it anyway. Don't be like my mother. I had to get on to her multiple times because her idea of therapy was make sure it doesn't hurt. And the moment you begin to think that it might start to hurt, stop. Don't go any further. Do you know what that will do for you? Absolutely nothing. No, no. You make it hurt. You work. And lo and behold, here I am a hundred years later. Look at me. <laughs> That's what we do spiritually in engaging the truth war. In engaging the fight for truth, sometimes it may hurt a little bit. But you know what? You do it anyway. 
You say, well, pastor, why? Why should I subject myself to such discomfort? Because the faith is at stake. And for some people, eternity may actually be at stake. You do not want to be complicit in presenting a gospel that's actually a lie, that actually brings condemnation. And that's one of the dangers of theological error. Eternity really is at stake for some people. There is a gospel that is no gospel at all. It doesn't save. In fact, it condemns. Paul mentions that in the book of Galatians in chapter 1. Remember, Paul said to these Galatians, this is one of the earliest missionary areas where Paul went, some of the earliest churches that he founded. And in addressing them, he found out that there were some who came teaching error. And Paul addresses them in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, and he tells them, if anyone comes to you preaching a gospel other than the one that you heard me preach, may he be damned. You say, well, that's strong. That is not politically correct. I don't believe people would have liked Paul today. Well, guess what? If you actually stand for the truth in many arenas today, they won't like you either. That goes with the territory of truth. Why do you think people so get so bent out of shape when you present the absolute truth of the gospel in this relativistic truth world today? It's because the truth sometimes is painful. That's how important the truth is. It really does matter. It matters what you believe. There is an objective revealed truth and Jude is calling all hands on deck to this emergency to stand for the faith. So there is an urgency and there is an emergency in the stand for the faith of Jude's passionate call. I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which has once for all been handed down to the saints. My friends, understand something. In this world in which we live today... The Christian faith, the faith, has not changed. It will not change. The objective body of truth is unchanging and unchangeable. It has been expressed. It has been settled once for all. It has been entrusted to believers. And our call is to make it known. Listen, we did not invent the gospel. Human beings did not invent the gospel. The gospel was revealed to us by God through the person and work of Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son. Thomas Manton, the, uh, the Purit English Puritan from the 17th century, said of this faith, it is not a thing invented but given, not found out by us, but delivered by God Himself and delivered to our custody that we might keep it for eternity. My friends, that means we have no right to modify the gospel. We have no right to add to it. We have well, we dare not take from it. Scripture addresses both of these. Paul addresses it in Galatians, the adding to it, the legalism that was added to the gospel that made the gospel that was being proclaimed no gospel at all. We've got the same thing with Jude, only in this case, there is a license being given and they're taking away from the gospel. And we've got the same thing today. People who are presenting a gospel that is no gospel at all. And in all cases, the consequences not only are, but you can count on it, they bring damnation. The urgency of the appeal. The emergency of the appeal. And thirdly, let me begin to look at the adversaries of Jews' appeal. Who exactly is Jude talking about when he says this, certain persons have crept in unnoticed. Those who are long beforehand marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly persons who are turning the grace of God into licentiousness, denying our only master, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, Jude just simply calls them certain persons who have managed to infiltrate the church. I believe he could have been much more specific than he was. I believe he could have named names. However, he doesn't do that. He chose not to do that. And it makes me ask the question, why? Why wouldn't he be more specific? 
And I really believe it's the same deal with the fact that we can't identify the specific group of believers. In God's providence, this becomes a means of being able to more accurately apply the message across the board in church history. In different times, different seasons, uh, we don't have to look for a specific thing. We look for the more general, and that is the perversion of truth. So there is an an anonymity here that I believe is providential. And that anonymity allows for more accurate assessment and application throughout time. It's a reminder to us that this is not about personality or likability. It's about accountability and accuracy. Have you ever noticed that error, heresy, are popular and they tend to originate with the most likable of people? Have you noticed that? Many of the biggest church, in fact, the biggest church in America, is being led by someone very likable. And people love it. And they love him. But he's a heretic. He perverts the gospel. He promotes compromise. In fact, there are three or four that are in my mind right now that are doing that, and they're very popular. They're examples of the gospel that's no gospel at all. And yet, people flock to it. Pastor, how do you explain that? Well, Jesus told us through Paul that it was going to be that way. The closer we get to the coming of Jesus, the more we're going to see things like that. That people are going to want to be told what they want to hear. They don't want to hear the truth. They want to hear what they want to hear. And the message is very compatible to our favorite sins. Because if you dismiss the absolute truth of the gospel and absolute categories with sin, then anything becomes acceptable. And you begin to compromise that. And the next thing you know, you're leading people down the path to hell. Because it's not sin that they're wanting to turn from. It's just the difficulties of life that they're wanting to turn from. And they're wanting to have it their way. Listen, the gospel is not Burger King. You cannot have it your way. The gospel is an absolute message. Christ died for our sin according to the Scripture. He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the Scripture. Now, it's not just enough to hear that. You have to understand the meaning of that. Why would the Son of God have to give His life? Because of you, that's why. Because of your sin. You owe an infinite debt that you cannot pay. He paid the infinite price that does cover your sin. And it's important that He rose from the dead to do so. Even... Just as important as the fact that it's not just enough to believe that, my friends, listen, it has to transform your life. If there's no difference in your life, it doesn't matter how high you jump in excitement when you hear truth if it doesn't change your life. Now, now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that your works don't have anything to do with your salvation, but your works prove that you've experienced it. And if there's no change in your life, what makes you think you were ever changed? The truth matters. The truth absolutely matters. I've learned, if you're going to stand on theological, biblical truth with accuracy and accountability to that truth, you'd better get ready for the attack. You'd better be ready for the culture to think ill of you. I began with a quote from Spurgeon a sermon that he preached in 1858. Do you know how old Charles Spurgeon was when he preached that? He was, 19, it was, he was born in 1834. So he was only 24 years old. He began to pastor when he was only 19. New Park Street Church grew astronomically, but as... Spurgeon began to preach and stand on the gospel. He began to come under attack. It started very early on. He recognized not only from experience, but also from Scripture, that we should expect that if we stand for the truth, if you proclaim the truth. If you go against the current popular fads of the culture, 
you can expect all kinds of opposition. So expect it today as we stand against some of the incredible things that are going on in our culture. Do not compromise on the truth. One of the great leaders of the 20th century is a leader that was known as the Iron Lady. You know who the Iron Lady is? Margaret Thatcher, first woman prime minister of the UK of of, uh, Great Britain and Northern Ireland. For 11 years, from 1979 to 1990, has there been a more dynamic political duo than the Iron Lady and Ronald Reagan? She exerted tremendous influence, not only in Great Britain and the UK, but abroad. She was either revered or she was reviled because she told the truth. Now, she's speaking politically here. She's not speaking spiritually, but there is certainly application to the spiritual nature of truth. Margaret Thatcher's philosophy was this. She said, do you know that one of the great problems of our age is that we're being governed by people who care more about feelings than they do about thoughts and ideas? We've got the same problem today, by the way. People want to determine what they believe based more on feelings than on truth. She goes on to say this, if you just set out to be liked, you should be prepared to compromise on anything at any time, and you will achieve absolutely nothing. You want to make a difference in people's lives? Stand on the truth. Do not compromise the truth. Be prepared to confront anything that comes against the truth. Stand and be a soldier in the truth war. Well, Jude here says there are certain persons who have infiltrated the church, adversaries, if you would. Who are they? Well, we don't really know. He doesn't give us enough to actually pinpoint definitively. Again, in God's providence, it gives us a broader application. I think it's entirely possible that these are some itinerant teachers, traveling preachers, if you would. That was very common in the first century, who began to make a name for themselves. And because they were becoming popular, they were given a wider audience. Does that sound familiar? Someone becomes popular, and everybody wants to hear them and flock to them because they're popular. But then you have to kind of stop and hear what they're saying. And Jude did that, and he learned that the message they were giving is not quite right. As they're making a name for themselves, they're becoming attractive to those who are not well grounded in truth. And they're easily manipulated, implying that these teachers were good at self-promotion and flattery. In verse 16 of Jude, Jude chastises them for speaking arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of gaining an advantage, using people. They were taking the language of the gospel and twisting the grace and mercy of God into sensuality into licentiousness. In other words, they were perverting the truth. Now, my friends, that sounds eerily familiar to where we are today in terms of right biblical doctrine, but also in terms of right biblical practice. The gospel is meant to confront not only theological error, but practical error. Again, it really does matter how you understand the gospel in application to everyday life. By the way, none of this is unexpected. It was predicted. Jude reminds us of that. These were long beforehand marked out for condemnation. In essence, what he's saying there, the truth has always been under attack. I mentioned earlier, it started in Genesis chapter 3 with those words, those infamous words, did God say? I hear it today in the question. In fact, on one pastor thread I was reading last night, some person asked the question to, to the pastors in this thread, does the Bible say homosexuality is a sin? And boy, the discussion was interesting, to say the least. The thing that really struck me is the incredible degree of compromise that was being put forth, rather than recognizing the absolute nature of sin. 
taking the gospel and twisting grace and mercy into sensuality. Jude calls these people ungodly people, meaning not of God. My friends, here's how you tell if a man is a man of God. The character of a man of God is always revealed in his behavior. And his behavior is always evidence of what he truly believes. Look at the moral life of the individual. Look at what he promotes. Look at what he calls sin and what he doesn't call sin. What is he compromising on? And you'll begin to get a handle on where he really stands. Here's the root of the problem. The root of the issue that makes these people adversaries of the gospel is that they actually are taking grace, twisting grace, and promoting sin, and in doing so, actually denying Christ. The word that's used here for sensuality is a very graphic word. He carries everything, every sense of meaning from sensuality to debauchery to sexual permissiveness. In other words, they turn the message of the gospel from a come-as-you-are message to a stay-as-you-are message. Right? We, we sing hymns of invitation. Just as I am without one plea, come just as you are. Can you come to Jesus as you are? Yes, but you don't stay as you are because he changes you. If you stay as you are, something has gone wrong. When Paul asked the question to the church at Rome in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? His response is not uncertain. His response is the strongest possible response he could give. Absolutely not. May it never be. Or like I like to put it, are you serious? You seriously asking that? In no uncertain terms. No, you do not remain in sin. Today there are those who are telling you and promoting a sinful agenda that actually promotes licentiousness in the fact that they're telling you, we don't know how many genders there are. We believe genders are fluid. We believe you can be whatever you want to be. We believe any and every expression of human sexuality is legitimate. I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but if you don't know if you're male or female and you can be anything you want, then everything goes. Everything goes. This is nothing short of an absolute assault on truth. It matters that we're created in the image of God. And the image of God is not that up for confusion. Sinclair Ferguson in his book, Devoted to God, really hit the heart of this. He said, we live in an antinomian world. Antinomian means against the law. In other words... There is no rule, do whatever you want, live however you live. We live in an antinomian world. We frequently hear that God loves us the way we are. The truth is that since the fall of Adam, God has loved only one person the way he is. We've lost sight of the fact that it is the way we are by nature that put Christ on the cross. The biblical perspective is quite different. God loves us despite the way we are. Far too many people today simply do not understand that the doctrinal and the moral are connected. They don't understand that. What I believe determines how I behave. So my friends, look at your own behavior, your own moral, your own moral standards. That will tell you what you really believe. If you hold to the biblical teaching about man and sin, you can't help but see your need of the Savior. And as a result, it will change your life. Otherwise, you pervert the grace of God into sensu sensuality and you deny your Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. The greatest challenge that you and I are facing today to the authority of Scripture is the authority of my experience. That's the greatest challenge we're facing today. It's an authority challenge. 
And far too many people are saying, my experience is my ultimate authority. No, the ultimate authority is the infallible, inerrant word of God. That is your authority. And if your feelings go against the authority of Scripture, you'd better make your feelings subservient to the ultimate authority of Scripture. Otherwise, you too will deny your only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. If you genuinely believe the gospel, then my friends, you have no freedom to believe anything other than what Jesus taught. And what Jesus taught, he gave to his disciples, to the apostles, who wrote it down for us. And it's here that we find the faith revealed. And it's that faith that we've been called to stand on and stand up for. That is the truth war. Welcome to the truth war. Now, we just get warmed up. But we're done for the morning. From this point forward, Jude is going to get graphic about the consequences of what is happening here. And we're going to begin to apply that to the 21st century American church culture. And it's going to get interesting. So, welcome to the truth war. Father, thank you this morning for the opportunity to begin to explore the call of every believer to stand for truth. Father, thank you for the truth. Jesus tells us that we would know the truth. The truth would set us free. In fact, if we are here today and we know you, then we have been set free. The question we should ask ourselves, Father, am I consistently living that freedom that I have in Christ? Lord, we are living in a world, in a culture, that is attacking and bringing the gospel under assault. We are the incarnation of Christ in this world, the church, the body of Christ. We have been called to engage in this truth war. Jude is giving us this urgency, this emergency, helping us to identify the adversaries so that indeed we can stand on truth. And our goal is not just to be right. Father, our goal is to help people come to know the truth that they might truly know what it means to be set free. So, Father, help us to grasp the word. May the word grab hold of us. And, Father, may we be soldiers in the truth war. We give you all honor, praise, and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.